and gentlemen, welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast, igniting both the art and the science of functional medicine. Here's your host, Dr. Brad Watts. Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast. I'm Dr. Brad Watts. Thank you for joining me here once again in the podcast lab. Glad to have you. So thank you to all of you new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing on YouTube. Thumbs up button. We appreciate it. It helps us reach more people. Thank you also to all of you that have given us a five-star rating on iTunes. If you get your media on iTunes or YouTube or Stitcher, however you do it, thank you for subscribing. We appreciate your participation. So uh, as always, I hope the information here today is information that's going to help you change somebody's life not in like five years, like tomorrow, and uh, information that's useful that you can put into practice right away. So yes, today, today we're talking about COVID-19. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't know if I could listen to another podcast or news broadcast about that. I mean, if I ever have to listen to one again, it'll be too soon. So <laughs> so we're moving on. From the COVID-19 topic. Today what we're going to talk about is some of the usefulness of uh, glycomark in treating patients that have type 2 diabetes. Supporting patients that are trying to reverse their condition or the symptoms associated with their condition. Something super important to keep in mind. So we're going to get into that and uh, if you are somebody that's new to the functional medicine arena, Make sure you're checking out some literature. Make sure you are checking out some of the video series I put together for Biogenetics. You can find that at biogenetics.com. And they have an Add Nutrition button on their homepage. Check it out. And uh, that will help point you in the right direction there. So anyhow, uh, for those of you that are treating patients uh, anew, like restarting your practices basically, restarting the marketing systems and the patient acquisition process. For those of you that are in that spot, make certain that you do it the right way this time. Do it a way that you want to. Like, what's your vision for your practice? Make sure that you're building your practice from the ground up this time. And uh, this is one of those once-in-a-lifetime situations where practice goes away, but the demand doesn't. Remember that. Your practice likely shrunk over the last 90 days, but the demand for your services did not. So that means that when you open up your doors again, and hopefully that's now, uh, when you open up your doors again, that market is going to come rebounding back. When you compress something long enough, it's going to come screaming back. And that's where we are currently. So make sure when you're building your practice that you start out building it from the ground up once again and make sure it's something that... um, is like your dream practice, right? If you don't want to be there 60 hours a week, then don't start building it as if you're going to be there 60 hours a week. And so just a friendly reminder, I know a lot of people are thinking about the mechanics of how they want to build their practice a second time. And so just a friendly reminder, once again, to make sure that you sit down, make a list of all of the things that are important to you in your life, and then build around that. Build around that. If your family is the most important thing to you, probably don't build a practice that's based off of your time alone. Probably don't do that. right? There are a thousand ways to, to have your practice the way that you want. And, um, and just make sure that you start off on your best foot forward here with that. So, All right. Cool. Additionally, if we're talking about getting patients back to health and, and back into a position where they're having a lifestyle that's compatible with health and healing rather than a lifestyle that's compatible with sickness, disease, uh, I think it's important to make sure that uh, you have a program that puts them in position for that. So revamping, whether it be a de-inflammatory cycle or a, you know, a detox, something like that, Not a bad idea to start patients out uh, with a reset button, especially after quarantine. Patients have been at home, emotionally eating, watching the news all day, and uh, and obviously you're going to find them in a position that's different than where we left them. And so that's important. They've been at home uh, pouring their own uh, adult beverages, and 
you know as well as I do that uh, their alcohol tolerance is probably higher now than it was <laughs> when when uh, this whole quarantine started. So anyway, detox, de-inflammatory cycle, whatever you call it, whatever you do in your practice, make sure that you have a reset button available and you're ready to use it. So very good. So today we're going to be talking about glycomark, as I mentioned. And for those of you that have taken my blood chemistry course, um, you learned all about glycomark for about an hour and a half and, uh, and its usefulness in supporting patients that have type 2 diabetes. And uh, what's super cool and what I appreciate about it is that it's a marker on the move. It's something right now that not a lot of providers in the landscape are using because of its novelty. The second reason why I like it so much is that it is a true functional marker that tells you about your patient's blood sugar balance, their control, their ability to maintain a small window when it comes to blood glucose values. Now that small window in the medical literature is uh, something that needs to be around in order for your patients to avoid chronic disease in the long run. But what if they already have it? What if they've already been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes? Right. We're going to talk about a couple of different scenarios today. Hopefully it motivates you to start using Glycomark in assessing your troublesome cases, the ones that you just can't crack the code on, and give us a little bit more insight into the mechanism of their dysfunction. Now, Glycomark is a brand name. And so there's a, a company called Nippon Kayaku, which basically developed Glycomark and the actual chemical name of it, right, is called 1,5-anhydroglucitol. 1,5-AG, 1,5-anhydroglucitol. It's a monosaccharide. It's found in almost all foods. Blood concentrations of this stuff uh, decrease during hyperglycemic events. So blood sugar goes above 180 and the body starts getting rid of 1,5-anhydroglucitol. What's awesome is that it will return to normal levels within a two-week window in the absence of high blood sugar. So that means as your patient's healing, their glycomark goes up. When your patient's sick and blood sugars are out of control, glycomark is low. If you don't get anything else out of the podcast today, <laughs> let that be the thing, all right? Glycomark is low when your patients are sick. When we look at glycomark in relationship to hemoglobin A1c, remember hemoglobin A1c is a measurement of how much hemoglobin by percentage, right, how much hemoglobin has been glycosylated or uh, sugar has been added to it. So that means that the higher your hemoglobin A1c, the worse your blood sugar control is. So the lower the glycomark, the worse you are, and the higher the A1c, the worse you are in theory. The opposite of that is true as well. The higher the glycomark, the better blood sugar control. And within reason, the lower the A1C, the better blood sugar control you're dealing with. Now, there are pathologies of low blood sugar, right, associated with a low A1C. So we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about a normal hemoglobin A1C. Ideally, we're sitting somewhere between 5 and 5.5 for hemoglobin A1C. Medical literature talks about A1C less than 5.2 may be uh, predisposing you to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in the future. And so that's still uh, debatable. There are studies that also talk about it uh, being under 5 is ideal. And for me, for my patients, based off the medical literature that I've read, I want to keep it between 5.0 and 5.5. That's ideal. Now with glycomark, what we want to do is we want to make sure that their glycomark is above 12. Now, if we're above 12, that means that our approximate, our average post-meal maximum blood sugar is less than 180. That's awesome. Okay, so if we're above 12 on a glycomark, it means your blood sugar is not surging past 180. That's what we're aiming for. If the blood sugar is going past 180, that's creating a large window. We call that a glucose excursion. A large window. So let's say your fasting blood sugar is 85 to 99. If your glycomark is 8, I know that your blood sugar is going from 85 to 99 
far past 180, let's say 190 is where you're at, right? And that's a large window, a 100 point swing. That means that your blood sugar stability is lacking control. You're the mechanisms that are controlling blood sugar, insulin, glucagon, etc., are lacking fine control. So they're lacking fine control. Now, glycomark values that are above 12, I know that were less than 180, and that's about as good as you can ask of anybody. Now, really what I wanted to talk about today is I wanted to be in a spot where we have glycomark versus A1C. I want to talk about these patients that have an A1C and a glucose value that don't match. Okay, This is where the usefulness in glycomark shows up. So let's say you have a patient, hemoglobin A1C, the measurement of their blood sugar control right, that you would typically use and has been used for decades uh, by physicians all over the world, hemoglobin A1C is 10, double digit, 10.0. 10.0 is obviously going to be a stressful position for your patients. And at a 10.0, you can expect them to have some level of a blood sugar uh, average around 275. So 10.0 is approximately 275 on an A1C scale. You can just Google an A1C scale, and, uh, and that way you can correlate your A1C percentage to your 60 to 90 day blood sugar average. 275, 10.0. Nice round number there. And what we're looking at with a 10.0 and a glucose, fasting glucose, let's say, of 97. So if the fasting blood sugar does not match the A1C, there's cause for concern. There's cause for concern because you're looking at a patient that has terrible blood sugar control. Not only does it go high, but it can also be normal. I'm talking about this today because I've seen maybe a dozen cases in the last week with this very same mechanism. When you see a blood sugar value of 97 fasting glucose and an A1C, that doesn't match something like 10. Um, I want to make sure that you remember to measure glycomark. For a patient that has a 97 and they are averaging 275, that means for every 97 that they pull, they are also seeing something along the lines of 500. If they're averaging 275 and you're seeing 97 glucose fasting in the morning, that means postprandial after they're done eating, their blood sugar is skyrocketing. So most of the time, these patients are going to have a glycomark value that's less than three. And you'll be shocked the first few times that you see it because what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to sensitize insulin receptor sites with these patients. That's really what you're going to want to do. And I'm telling you, don't do that. What happens is, is you give a patient something like glucostatic balance or effexalin or glycin or protoglycin or any of the other uh insulin receptor site sensitization supplements on the marketplace, things that support your body's ability to create a normal level of insulin sensitivity, you want to use those in a patient that has diabetes, especially because their A1C is so high, right? I know you do. I know you do because for years and years, I taught providers how to do that. And then we would use food in order to control their blood sugar window alongside of that right? We would use food like, make sure you eat frequently enough to stabilize your blood sugar. Well, how often is that, Dr. Watts? Well, what I'm going to have you do is eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks in between. That was how we treated patients that had blood sugar instability issues. Why would we do that? We would treat patients that have blood sugar instability issues with frequency of eating mechanisms because they lacked the ability to control their blood sugar with hormones. So we would just let them control the blood sugar with food. And, uh, and I'm going to explain what I mean here momentarily. But that is a treatment strategy that, in my opinion, is uh, second rate at this point because of the technology and advances in supplementation. Okay, so I'm just throwing that out there because a lot of people still treat patients that way. And it's my opinion that, uh, that we got to stop doing that. My opinion. Now, part of the reason for that is that frequent exposure to food is going to increase a patient's risk of cardiovascular disease. I don't care what they're eating because a lot of the risk of cardiovascular disease 
is associated with insulin exposure. And if you're constantly exposing patients to food, even if it's good food, you're still going to have insulin exposure that's higher than what you'd like. That's just a reality. And so when we look at moving patients toward uh, wellness, intermittent fasting, in all of the available medical literature that I've read on the topic, intermittent fasting is where it's at. The best thing you can do for your patients to promote health and healing and wellness is giving them an opportunity to avoid food for a little while. Like in religious cultures all over the planet, there's this idea that there's judgment in in food, like gluttony, right? There's judgment in that. And whether it be uh, those beliefs written in people's DNA and now the body's acting accordingly, or whether it be just a an interesting observation that goes along with the rules of physiology, there is actually some level of stress associated with frequent food exposure. And I, I just throw that out there because if we're going to be treating patients on a large scale associated with like diabetes or insulin resistance issues, even if they don't have diabetes, but they have insulin resistance, right? We want to make sure that we understand that the available medical literature at this point is talking about intermittent fasting being a way forward. That's the most advantageous for these patients. Okay. So let's square that away first. Now, when we're looking at a patient that has a low glycomark, let's say less than two, and we have a patient that has an A1C that's elevated, like a 10. Okay, so this is a pretty significant diabetes uh, situation. And we're also looking at a patient who has a blood sugar, a fasting blood sugar around 100, right? It could be 125, 140, whatever it is, as long as it's not matching the A1C. We're looking at a massive window of operation for blood sugar control or lack of control. That instability that you're seeing there, that instability where we can go low and we can go high, has to be controlled. We have to have a strategy that allows us to move this patient in the right direction. Again, what we used to do was use food to control blood sugar, so you'd have the patient eat frequently enough that their blood sugar starts to come down. Patients would get better, but to a point. The other thing that we would do is use something that supports the body's ability to create insulin sensitivity once again. Herbs that have been shown in the medical literature to do that. So quick summary of what we just talked about. If you use herbs like this, product supplements, that sensitize insulin receptor sites and support the body's ability to lower the blood sugar, in a situation where the patient's blood sugar can already go low, like a 97, but can also go very high, what tends to happen is we start triggering the body's protective mechanisms for low blood sugar. For instance, if you have somebody that has a 97, they eat breakfast and the blood sugar is on the way up, insulin values are on their way up uh, because we have these glucose excursions, right, where the blood sugar is going way over 180. And I give somebody um, these supplements that will support the body's ability to dampen insulin resistance. Well, what happens is, is the blood sugar tends to go too low. Now, because the body is producing a massive amount of insulin, because we have terrible sensitivity to begin with, okay, massive amount of insulin gets produced in response to that donut for breakfast, and now I'm giving a patient uh, one of these supplements. What we're doing is we're opening up or we're sensitizing insulin receptor sites while we have a massive insulin spike. That's going to create a situation where the blood sugar doesn't just stay at 97. It has the potential to drop significantly. And so because uh, our body is wired for a blood sugar window, somewhere between 65 and about 150, that's like the sweet spot where your hormones will start messing with the balance above that and below that, we trip the body's protective mechanism. When blood sugar goes too low, which is relative statement, right, because it's based off of your level of sensitivity to insulin, when blood sugar goes too low, your body will trigger glucagon. So pancreas will produce glucagon. Glucagon tells the liver to dump stored sugar into the bloodstream. We end up in a position where we're tripping our low blood sugar protective mechanism because we are both using a nutrient, a blended nutrient that supports insulin sensitivity, and patients producing a truckload of insulin. 
Now, most of these patients that have a low glycomark and a high A1C, most of these patients are already on insulin. So they take their post-meal insulin, right? The short-acting stuff. And we start seeing this up and down nature of the, uh, the patient's blood sugar window. Now, one of the problems with a low glycomark and an elevated A1C is this, this issue with glucagon. The body will produce, the pancreas itself produces glucagon as well as insulin, right? The problem is that the off switch for glucagon production is insulin. And when a patient's insulin resistant, we're stuck because the off switch doesn't work, right? If my off switch is resistant, we end up in a position where now there's nothing to turn off glucagon. And so I eat a meal and glucagon still is being secreted okay? because there's no off switch, even if I'm taking insulin because the doctors that gave me the insulin I'm injecting created a problem where now my body's resistant to the very thing they told me was going to help heal. It's a crazy world, man. Crazy world. So fortunately, uh, science has done enough research right now from a, a clinical perspective to find that GABA is an off switch for glucagon activity as well. The problem is, is that if you give your patients enough GABA to make that off switch functional, right? usually it stimulates a uh, gut reaction where we have a flushing because GABA is inhibitory in the central nervous system, but it's excitatory in the enteric nervous system. So if you put a bunch of GABA, like enough GABA, let's say 1,000 milligrams of GABA required in order, and the number's arbitrary, but let's say 1,000 milligrams of GABA required in order to turn off glucagon activity, what happens is, is that 1,000 milligrams of GABA hits the gut, and the gut's like, oh, we're having a bowel movement? When? Now. Right now. Okay, and your patient's in the bathroom for the rest of the morning. That's not helpful. So one of the things that we've been using uh, is liposomal GABA, and liposomal GABA gives us an opportunity to have massive absorption rates that uh, can essentially happen far before we ever hit the gut. So whatever GABA does hit the gut in a liposome is much less than what's required to trigger a gut flushing reaction, a diarrhea situation. So anyway, side note, um, when we look at GABA being an off switch, a physiologic off switch for glucagon activity, what it does is it is it really it gives us uh, an opportunity to create blood sugar stability while the patient can still avoid food. Because what GABA does is it turns off glucagon in the presence of food, right? So that means that if a patient uses GABA, it's selective. It does not turn off glucagon activity in a fasting state. That's super important because if you turn off the patient's ability to raise their blood sugar and they're already at like a 60, they're going to be a hurting unit pretty quick. But fortunately, the body uh, uses GABA selectively. It's only postprandial that it does dampen glucagon activity. That's a beautifully complex situation. Beautiful. So here's the situation now. Instead of your patients using food to control their blood sugar uh, window, remember they can go low and they can go high as explained by their glycomark and their A1C, instead of a patient using that type of a situation, right? Using food in order to control that. Using GABA allows us to still participate with intermittent fasting, allowing the body to return to insulin sensitivity without having to overexpose it to food constantly. Intermittent fasting is awesome in this instance. It pairs very well with GABA and gives your patients an opportunity to really jumpstart their lifestyle. A lifestyle that's compatible with health and healing rather than a lifestyle that's compatible with normalizing blood sugar but cardiovascular disease. Rather than a lifestyle that's compatible a blood sugar that's improving but cognitive decline. Right? We can't have we can't trade diabetes for another disease process and in my opinion when we overexpose patients to food to try to control their blood sugar that's what happens, right? That's, it's the natural result. It's the natural end point for a patient that needs food to heal them. 
there's no healing in food, right? That might come across as a, a blunt statement to some people, but there's no healing in food. There's just less death in good food. There's no healing in it. There's just less death. And what's important is to make sure that we understand that because the healing comes from the electricity flowing through your body that like allows you to blink your eyes and you know and move your hand up and down and talk and your heart's beating. That's where the healings come from. Right? That's where it's happening. The fact that we have to have food in order to keep that electricity cruising along is an interesting concept. Uh, but I think that we far, far overdo it in general with the food. So intermittent fasting, allowing your patients improvement, right? But GABA, definitely necessary at that point. You can still use products that sensitize insulin receptor sites, but it is important to make sure that that's being done with food and with GABA because otherwise what happens is, is we just ping pong back and forth between low and high and low and high. And if you've ever had low blood sugar, physio physiologically low blood sugar, right? What happens is, is it feels like you're going crazy. Sometimes patients feel bipolar because they're like, you've heard the term hangry, right? They're hangry, they eat food, and then they're delirious, and then they get hangry, and then they're delirious, and it's just this ping-ponging back and forth, and they have this instability that shows up, and they, nobody likes that, right? Nobody likes being around people that are unstable, and so, anyway, a mechanism for you to consider when you're supporting your diabetes patients. Check out the glycomark. Look. Look. When they can go low and they can go high. It's about figuring out how high. How high. Right? If their glycomark's less than 2, for instance, their blood sugar is way over 290. Way over 290. Right? And it gives you an opportunity to understand just how far that spike might be. Just how far. So check it out, get an A1C chart, right? You can Google those, get a glycomark chart. You can Google that as well. And, uh, and start analyzing your patients with a, a, a mind or an eye toward this mechanism. And what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing better blood sugars faster, better results faster. Who doesn't want better results faster? All right, thank you for listening to a few quick hits on glycomark, on hemoglobin A1C, and GABA, how to help your patients with their blood sugar control. If you've got any questions on it, obviously email me. And um, until next time, thank you guys once again for participating in the Nutrition Hero podcast. Love you. Have a great day.